we each have our own, you know, we niches. Dave likes to do certain things at the, at the resort, and I'm in the, the boating thing, and Jimmy has his part. With our particular family, I think it's uh, trust, total trust and caring for each other, it, almost to a fault. Knowing each of your two partners have got your back no matter what, you got it made. This is the story of a family named Jensen and their four decades owning and operating a unique resort property on Captiva Island, Florida. In this documentary, you'll see how the family captured the hearts of visitors from around the world with their love, laughter, and music, and left a legacy of caring for their guests, fellow island residents, and the local environment. Ladies and gentlemen, the Captiva Island Historical Society is proud to present the 10th documentary in its Captiva Memories Collection, From Laughter to Legacy, Captiva's Jensen Family. Wow, Red Jensen, my father. <laughs> Whoa, um, I, I didn't really start saying whoa until I uh, matured and I made a big wow whenever I thought of him. Uh, a salesman, salesman, and a, a lover of on, entrepreneurship. He loved business and he made it business an adventure. The story of the Jensen family's presence on Captiva begins in the early 1970s when an aluminum siding salesman from suburban Detroit named Red Jensen and his wife Betty bought a piece of property on North Captiva, sight unseen. That led to a series of other property purchases which ultimately led to the acquisition of Twin Palms Marina. He started out as a door-to-door -door salesman. If, if you ever seen the movie Tin Man with Danny DeVito, that's what he did. He sold uh, aluminum siding. Then he had a little uh, home improvement business, roofing, kitchen remodel. And, uh, but he was always buying, wheeling and dealing, doing a little real estate here, here and there. We were living in Michigan. Uh, it was a, a cold winter, as our father tells the story. Uh, in January, and the phone rings. Our father answers it, and it's a, a phone solicitor. And this person's selling vacant land on North Captiva. And our dad had never been to Florida, and he uh, bought the pitch, bought the lot, sight unseen. Uh, sometime later, our parents took the family down to, uh, to Sanibel, where we stayed, and we hired a captain to take us to North Captiva to see what they had bought. And uh, shortly after that, uh, in looking around, um, our parents uh, found the lot for sale where they built Jensen's on the Gulf. And, and then shortly after that, our dad met the um, owner of Twin Palms at the time, Errol Doan. They became friends, and that's how they, uh, our dad be, uh, came about buying Twin Palms. Twin Palms Resort, I think the first cottages were built in the 40s, and they were bit by bit built over those years. There's been five or six different families that have owned it before my parents bought it in 77, and all the cottages were there when we, our parents bought it. The original cottages were built by John Engel. He was a truck farmer from Ohio. Uh, he and his wife and his daughter ran, and it was mainly a winter business, um, as most places were back then. In the summer, there wasn't much going on. There was three other families that owned it prior to our family having it. The Woods, the Hughes, and the Doan family. But it was always called Twin Palms. Our father had assembled a group of friends to buy it. He, they didn't have the, the money to buy it on their own. And their intent was uh, for it to be an investment and um, you know sell it after the value went up. But, um, soon after owning it and operating it, our father got this dream in his head that if he could 
buy out his partners and have it for his family to run and operate. He thought it would be an incredible lifestyle, and he was right. <laughs> and thank God he, he was able to do it. When your heart is heavy and you're looking for peace of mind, take a ride into Jensen's and drift back in time. Where a man named Red found himself a little piece of paradise. He left his snow and ice behind and never thought about it twice. Our mom and dad did everything. They, our mom did the housekeeping, uh, they took the reservations, um, they, they did everything. And uh, when they realized that they might be able to buy out the partners and bring in the rest of the family, that's when, uh, you know, John and I and, and got involved and we began to help out. But our parents, they worked very hard in the beginning. You know, it was every single day. Our dad was a, a real character, and I think I still have people coming in here saying, oh, I remember your dad, and, you know, he's been gone 25 years. But uh, he would take guests out on boats, people staying here, hey, come on, let's go up to Cabbage Key or take a boat ride. And uh, he made people feel like family. Uh, my father, Red, had a, just didn't do a lot of flashy stuff, but he loved a, his car. And his favorite card was a convertible two-seater red Mercedes. And when he f first got his first one and came out to the island, he was he could just beaming. He just loved to uh, pull up in that car. And when he did, as soon as he came up the driveway of the marina, me and John were out like it was a NASCAR pit crew. We were out there washing that thing down, wipe, drying it down. I mean, he had us trained. We took care of that car, and he loved it, too. And and uh, he, he, was, he was famous for uh, girls would walk by and go, oh, you know, they'd be looking at his car, and he'd say, uh, oh, you like this car? And the girls would say, yeah. And he goes, oh, would you like one? And they'd say, yeah. And he'd say, well, work your ass off for 40 years and you can have one. <laughs> Corky, uh, Jimmy's buddy, wrote a rap song about uh, our dad and his car, the Jensen rap. And uh, it's a great song. Jensen's Jim 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 Jimmy's Jim Jimmy's Jim Red Jensen is the name and they call me the king the grandmaster of the voted cottage rental thing read my lips and check this out we got the highest prices and there ain't no doubt come to Jensen's for an expensive room
Nana was my mother and early in our career here she was sitting out here in a chair and Red Jensen, the boy's dad, came down in his little red Mercedes convertible and he would sit and chat with us and you know because we were bringing money and that's what he told us to do you know when you come down bring bring money so and the boys then were working here and were walking by now and then doing things while Red was sitting there talking to my mother and and my mother looks at the boys and just to kind of goad him a little she says Mr. Jensen I don't understand she says I look at you and then I look at these three handsome boys and I'm wondering how did you ever have boys this handsome <laughs> and he didn't miss a beat he looked at her and he said well Mrs. Duncan I didn't make them with my face <laughs> It was the first time any of us kids had ever seen my mother totally got. She had nothing else to say for a moment. <laughs> I knew Red very well, and uh, him and my dad, they, they go back a long ways, and they were both two comedians. They were both Danish, and, um, and they used to always pull pranks on each other. And I remember one time my dad sent Red a snowblower down here, and uh, Red couldn't be outdone, so what he did is he went and got 3,000 Budweiser cans, laid them in front of one of the cottages with his boys that looked like they were buried under it, and Red has a snowblower with Budweiser cans flying out of it. So, and it, it, that went on and on and on with these guys. Our famous tugboat, which we use for our tools and storing, and it was uh, another one of my father's great acquisitions. He uh, saw this in the boat trader for sale, the wheelhouse of a tugboat in Tampa for $500 and he said that would be perfect at the marina. So he bought it, got it down here and bragged how he got such a great tool shed for $500 but it didn't tell everyone it cost him $3,000 to get it down here but that, that was probably in the 80s and it's been there since and it's an icon. People remember it forever. Red Jensen, the legendary leader of the Jensen clan. When I first met him, I think it was 1983, and I was a cub reporter for Wink TV. And when I came upon the Jensen Marina, I knew I had a hell of a story. Guys, get to work. Welcome to a typical day at Jensen's Twin Palm Marina. Of course, today is just a little bit different. You see, the boys know they've either got to bring one back or not bother to come back. Okay, you guys, you had better bring fish back. Okay. This okay. is the only time I'm asking. You never bring fish back. Do it this time. We will, we will. Ah, yes, the joys of having a family run business. And if you're wondering why they even bother, the answer is really quite simple. Best boating area I feel that I've ever been to. Uh, this Beautiful islands that are real close by. Uh, good fishing, shelling's excellent, and we're always out on the boats. Although all three of the Jensen's hold a captain's license, there's really only one skipper at the helm. The real captain, the real commander in chief, that's Big Daddy Red. And uh, my brother John and I uh, both work for our father and run Twin Palms, and it, it's a lot of fun. Of course, when there's fun to be had, it seems as though sooner or later everybody finds out about it. We've met uh, Ted Turner, who's in broadcasting. I've met uh, Ted Koppel's been here, and uh, Don Johnson stopped by. Twin Palms, they get a good feeling here. It's a family-run business, and we make them everybody feel real good and it's that family feeling that makes it all worthwhile for the boss big red i happen to feel very very fortunate that my sons have been with me for five years and they super super enjoy the place but more than anything they enjoy the people but of course when it comes to catching fish a father still needs to be stern bring me a real fish a real fish you bring me a stuffed fish you guys! Oh, oh. Stop!
the fish. Can you believe kids today? Sure can't, Red. I'm Long John Bafar on the Nautical News Beat. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Over the years, day-to-day -day management of Jensen's Twin Palms Resort would transfer to Red and Betty's three sons and their daughter, Pat, who moved to Seattle but continued to manage the reservation system for the business. Brothers John, Dave, and Jimmy became the public face of the property and were often featured in local publications for their commitment to maintaining the old Florida fish camp atmosphere and the casual, friendly hospitality environment for visitors. Our nature, genetics, which we got from our mom and dad, we, we enjoy everyone, and we like to hear other people's stories. These three guys, I watched them early on my visits down here. I mean, they were always together. This was when their father was still alive. I mean, they were here every day, seven days a week, working side by side, discussing, and I never, ever saw a crossword. I know they had them, but it was never in front of people. And then they befriended you, and you just felt like you were coming home after two or three visits. That's what makes Jensen's kind of special, because they have people show up. I mean, some people show up every year, some people show up and, you know, John will be up in cabin one for two months. And, but the people that come here and they have that deal, and that's why they come by, back. And sometimes you don't get it every year, but they've had some experience that they remember. I've been coming here since I was in my mother's belly and Ryan just started coming like six, six years, years ago, ago. Yep. but um, recently we got a golden retriever and we were in the process of naming him and we wanted to name him something that we both liked agreed on thought was a really good name and we settled on Jensen yep. so uh, he's currently at home but this is a picture of our guy He's awesome, and we couldn't have picked a better name. Yep. Love it. <laughs> this is the heart of the community right here. Them and their their staff here is it's uh, it's just a wonderful, relaxing place to be to be. How many words do you need to describe anything? You could say it's charming. You could say it's historical. Um, it's friendly. It's warm. There's music. It's spontaneous. So you just reel off those, those descriptors. I don't know if, it, it, if, it, if you could capture it all. And I, it, you have to experience it. What makes this special, of course, is the environment, the blue skies, the yellow sun, the ocean, and also the people. I've always met friendly people here. And uh, I like the idea of it being small, contained, and um, Actually, it's, a, it's sort of international, so there's people from all over, not only America, but all over the world. This is absolutely heaven on earth. And I, it's, yeah. it's just one of these places that you come along to, you feel at home. And I suppose to me, because I mean, like that, well, we drove around different parts of Florida, right? But this is like old Florida. You know, it, it, this is kind of when you, you walk into something magic about the place. Everybody has a story to tell. <laughs> some are better than others. <laughs> and some people bend the truth a little bit. <laughs> this is the only place on the, on the southwest Florida coast that actually looks like Florida. It, the, the rest of it looks like it could be anywhere. You know, you could be in Kuwait, for God's sakes, with all the crap that they've built and ruined the coast with. But here... It's really beautiful. In the earlier days, uh, there, we had houseboats that people lived on. And uh, uh, most of them were people that uh, uh, worked on the island and it was affordable housing. In fact, at the peak of it, I think we had 12 houseboats here. And it was quite the community. Recently, I have uh, uh, ran across uh, some of those people and they had very fond memories. They said it was the... Uh, the most favorite time of their lives, living on the houseboat. Remaining an old Florida fish camp, that congeniality. I've never seen the Jensen brothers angry at anybody. I never saw Red Jensen angry at anybody. I thought, how in the world can these people be so darn happy? If you're renting boats, that's going to be problems. I guarantee you, because I went through that at Tartan Bay. Uh, they continue that congeniality, that welcome you're welcome how are you those guys were always genuinely nice and welcoming and quirky 
that quirky aspect, how to define quirky, that is Jensen's. Justin, all the boat rentals back? Yeah, actually, yeah, we just got the last one here. Oh, killer. Quirkiness can easily be seen in the buildings that make up the office and reception area, which also boasts a t-shirt and tackle shop, a shower and fish cleaning area for the marina's boating customers, and a small fishing museum, which holds, among other things, the family's collection of antique fishing rods and the tackle collection of one of America's most revered sportsmen, Ted Williams. We acquired all these uh, this gear because Ted, Ted, Ted Williams is in the Fishing Hall of Fame, the Baseball Hall of Fame, and the Aviation. He was in World War II. He's in the Hall of Fame for uh, his service. Here we have two of Ted Williams' personal fishing rods, the open face reel, and here's another for back backcountry fishing. This is Ted Williams' personal tackle box. Ted liked to tie his own flies. And this is exactly how he left it, right here. And he has probably 30 tie flies in here that Ted tied himself. While Ted Williams never actually visited Jensen's, there are photos of many celebrities posted on the wall who did. We've had quite a few. We, uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. took a boat out here. Uh, Ted Turner fished for a couple days out of here. Kevin Costner his, took his family on a pontoon boat. You know, it's funny, you don't even know it's them till they, like John F. Kennedy Jr. came in to rent a boat and I was having him fill out the paperwork and uh, I didn't know it was him. And I go, I need to see your driver's license to rent the boat. And he showed it to me and I said, are you the John F. Kennedy Jr.? He goes, yeah. So. Uh, he took a boat out and they had a good time. He came back uh, and he, we had the game. It was a Sunday afternoon. We had the, I think it was the Knicks and the Lakers on TV. And he sat here for a couple hours and watched, watched the game with us. Perhaps the most well-known celebrity of Twin Palms was this guy, who's been waiting for big shrimp for decades. Jimmy tells us the idea came from another marina property in Florida. On our RV trip, we uh, Homo Sassa Springs pulled off, came across a place called McCray's Bait Shop in Homo Sassa Springs. Walking around, they had a sign on the door and it said, waiting for big shrimp. And they listed all the, yes, the shrimp are small. No, you can't pick them yourself. But we go that, because that's all the questions we get asked every day. We love this. We took a picture of it, had a, uh, a great guest that would stay in the winter, Madith Mantela, a great artist. She painted the sign like the picture we took. The sign was always by the bait tank, and then it came down to waiting for big shrimp, and Queenie came up with the skeleton idea. Put the skeleton under the sign, waiting for big shrimp, and and people would, you know, when are the shrimp going to be big? I, I say, get in line. That guy's been waiting a while. <laughs> Sometimes I think we laugh at just anything, but there is a lot of funny things that go on. <laughs> uh, you just, uh, I don't know, the bait shop, uh, it's just the natural setup for that type of thing. You would tell when the office opened. Actually, you would tell about 45 minutes before the office opened in the morning because you would hear, <laughs> you would hear the Jensen voice start to laugh. I'm gonna do it bad. Okay. I'll let you. <laughs> Jimmy, in case the camera can't oh. see. Yeah, was, yeah. Why, why did you have that nervous? <laughs> I was trying to keep beat with the yeah. meeting. <laughs> and oh. then you could tell when the office closed because, you know, the laughter sort of, it, it sort of dissipated. It never really went away, but it dissipated. What a great time, though. I mean, I, I don't know of anywhere else you can walk to work, maybe even barefoot. And the first thing you do when you get to work is you laugh. I mean, that, you just laugh. I, it, it's constant there. It's just uh, the 
the situations and people you get to meet and, and just yourselves, the stuff that goes on there, it's just incredible. We had a guest named Max Steinberg. He was from Harlem in New York. Uh, he had a newsstand cigar shop. He was constantly coming up with practical jokes. And uh, one of his favorite was he wore real baggy pants. And he had an oversized uh, pocket watch on a long chain, which he put down his pants through a zipper. And he would come in the office and he would encourage us when a customer came in to ask him what time it was. And he would unzip his pants and slowly pull this uh, pocket watch out and oh, lots of laughter. <laughs> Every Thanksgiving, Red and Christy, who live on Sanibel, would rent cottage number eight. Jim and his wife Jeannie and another couple would rent uh, another cottage and they would spend all Thanksgiving there. But every year he would have some kind of gag or joke he would pull on us. Though one of the better ones, one morning we knew he checked in late at night. When we got up in the morning, we went out to the road and there was this big sign hanging from the trees that said, coming soon, Walgreens. He'd taken it from a construction site where they were building a Walg Walgreens, <laughs> tied it up in the trees at night when he checked in, and we left it up the whole Thanksgiving week. This is probably one of the few places that you can come with a smile on your face to work and you leave with a bigger smile at the end of the day. Like today, what did we do? We had a beautiful day telling some stories and, and getting me paid to cook fish and talk shop with a bunch of people. And that seems like it's every day here at Jensen's. I did business with the Jensen boys constantly and, you know, would go to all their, any kind of function they'd have over there. Usually I'd try to show up and those guys were just, you know, they were kind of felt like family because they always treated you that way when you went there. Um, and my best memory is hearing Dave, you could hear Dave laughing from a half mile away. They were always joking and laughing constantly. So if you just wanted to get a laugh or, you know, hear something funny, just walk through that door. <laughs> <laughs> just that, a lot of laughing, a lot of laughing. Um, wow, that is, it, it is incredible uh, to think the scope of what we experienced here, um, let alone being in business and trying to make a living. They opened their place up to music here on uh, most of the time on Saturday or Sunday evening, and uh, uh, just musicians from all over the country come to to have the honor to stand up on that wood stage over there and, and play and bring laughs. And uh, it's uh, I just couldn't say enough positive things about uh, why this is the center of Captiva. Jensen's was cherished not only by the many repeat visitors who came, but by the residents of Captiva as well. Under the Jensen family ownership, the property was the site of many important social gatherings where important issues like clean water, beach erosion, environmental preservation, and the island's quality of life would be discussed. In fact, Dave Jensen was a commissioner for the Captiva Erosion Prevention District and was on the board of the Sanibel Captiva Chamber of Commerce, the Captiva Community Panel, and the Captiva Island Historical Society. When island residents wanted to raise enough money to protect a neighboring island, Buck Key, from development, they asked the Jensens to host a fundraising event so the entire island could participate. So that's when I got with the Jensen brothers and they threw a party you would not believe and it was a fundraiser so everybody could participate. And we collected from $10 up to thousands of dollars at this event. They had a fish fry, they had music, we had donations and people all over Captiva then got involved in it 
and we went over the over the record at that point of raising the 1.68 million dollars. So that was a community effort all the way. One, two, three, four. <laughs> If civic involvement and laughter were the heart of the Jensen Brothers' presence on Captiva, music was its soul. Youngest brother Jimmy and his longtime friend Corky Dunford started a band with island friends called the Trouble Starters, who would play at Twin Palms and at other island restaurants and resorts. The Trouble Starters officially got together and we were playing gigs and Corky was writing songs and he had uh, quite a few originals, and we did the first recording here at our, my house, which is known as Barefoot Studios. And I was, we were very excited to uh, be having this release. We had a great following on the island. Everyone kind of rooted for us, you know. They, uh, <laughs> we were a, kind of a mixed match, uh, you know, but we, every, everyone in the band was great. We were great friends. Our brother Jimmy, who, who's the, the music brother, uh, he went up to Florabama, uh, where there was a songwriters festival going on. And he, he met some songwriters, he invited them down, and uh, we organized one, one January a Super Bowl party and had these musicians come down, and it became an annual event, and it, it grew and grew, and it was it, very uh, popular with the locals. Jimmy would travel and meet a musician and say, come on down, spend a few nights, we'll do a little show out here. And we'd do trade-offs and then became great friends with a few of them. At Jensen's Marina, I'm walking on Coquina, over by good Galtina. I lost her at Jensen's Marina. Well, under the, the friendship uh, and the invitation of my friend Brent Moyer, who's another all-star picker, what they call him the Global Cowboy, uh, in 1998, again, I mentioned coming down to Florida out of Nashville to be with my folks. So Brent calls me up in 1998 from here, and he says, why don't you come to the Jensen's for a Super Bowl party? And uh, so this is 20 years now, 2018, and I'm still here. And I just, what I noticed about the Jensen's was uh, the freewheeling uh, comedic love and uh, concern and care, genuine care, not just as a business, but genuine care about the patrons. About the third time we, we got here, uh, we started calling that driveway the rabbit hole. When you turn in there, we're going down the rabbit hole into Wonderland. Okay, and uh, you can't help but love this place because it has the atmosphere of a 1950s fishing village. Between Joe, Son, Brent Moyer, Austin Church, there's probably 15 songs I know that came from them just staying on the island. And, and the effects, I mean, we've had some incredible <laughs> magical times. Brother Jimmy's uh, love for music, he has friends from all over the country that come and stay and we do a music week and uh, from one of those music weeks, uh, a thing we'd now do called the Marching Mullet Parade was born. Sound off, sound off. A 
group of locals and visitors will uh, get together at Jensen's Marina and we'll march to uh, the beach, the Mucky Duck, uh, as the sun's setting. We wanted to have it have the parade be spontaneous and fun, but also be a bit serious. So we would um, we would be sure to sing a song about the environment. We we often sang "This land is your land." We'd always uh, pick up one veteran to honor. Mm -hmm. It was a fun thing for us, but we really wanted to honor a veteran. We had some incredible people uh, over the course of the uh, parades. Um, we always included the current clergymen at the Captiva Chapel by the Sea to, uh, to do the benediction, the marching mullet benediction. It's in the spirit of old Captiva that we gathered here this way and remember those responsible for our presence here today. So we ask the mighty mullets to cast their blessings now upon those who have walked these shores before us and all who will walk here when we're gone. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. The music legacy of the Jensens lives on beyond Twin Palms through the music of John and Gina Jensen's son, Johnny. He started playing drums when he was three, and uh, I think he may have, because being over here at the marina, he may have picked up on that at an early age. And then Jimmy, uh, brother Jimmy, got him a couple uh, videos. Uh, a drummer, uh, Keith Moon, drummer for The Who. He watched that, and uh, he's got the talent for it. He picked that up, and uh, he did drums for a few years. Now he's playing guitar, and uh, right now he's doing shows. He's warmed up for Marshall Tucker, uh, one of the Supremes, uh, Jim Messina. He's a songwriter. You gonna tell me why I'm wrong? You gonna say my name is as the letters they were gone? It doesn't matter what you do. I always be in love with you forever and ever with you. He's got an album out and uh, might have a record deal coming up here pretty soon. I like to think it started from Twin Palms. That would be really cool. <laughs> you gonna tell me why I'm on. I want to go to southern Italy and uh, hang out on a farm. <laughs> uh, help my neighbors, pick olives, walk with the cows. Uh, I want to do that for at least a year and chill out. In the spring of 2019, Dave and Queenie surprised everyone when they announced they were fulfilling a longtime dream and moving to Italy. About a year earlier, the Jensen siblings had decided it was time to move on, and they put the properties up for sale. I think it was about 2014 or 2015 that Dave started talking to me at home about a five-year goal of retiring. And uh, every year he would revisit it and say, oh, you know, this, is, this will be the, the year that I tell John and Jimmy about it. And, and when he finally did, I, I was surprised. I was proud of him and surprised that they actually put a, you know, a plan into motion. It just worked out uh, good, but we had to, we knew it'd be a while. It's a unique property. You know, we had, uh, you know, we, we had quite a few people interested. It just never came to, you know, it took a while. To my surprise, in um, I think it was springtime around 2019, Dave said to when we were planning our annual trip to Italy, Dave said to me, uh, you know, this year, why don't we just leave the, uh, the return trip open-ended? And I'm like, what? He said, yeah, let's move there. And so I knew he was ready to, uh, to go, to leave the business. It was a surprise to me he was going to go that far away. Dave had a big 
garden in Italy, and every day he would um, work on the garden under the supervision of our 90-year-old neighbor, the man that sold us the house. Um, Dave and Dominic would um, either plan what was going in next or work on the work on the art. Dave journaled uh, quite a bit and kept in constant communication, maybe too much communication with his brothers because even though he was willing to walk away from the business, he still wanted to help them out <laughs> because, <laughs> because obviously he was the warrior and, and didn't want them to take on uh, more of a load. You know, he'd call these guests that had been friends for all these years. He would uh, call and tell them, oh, I see you're checking in next week. Just mm -hmm. want to know, you know, how are the kids? Mm -hmm. Did your you know, dog get that rash cleared up? <laughs> <laughs> Everything he knew. It was a Friday. Dave and I had gone to um, help our friend Giovanni cut and tie back his grapevines, which is what you do January, February. And, um, and we had a beautiful day. It was crisp and just cool enough that that kind of work felt really good. But we were in Giovanni's vineyard for, from sunup to just before sundown. And you know, life's not always like those picture-perfect moments, but that was a perfect day. And the next morning, Dave got up um, with, with his alarm because we were supposed to go help Giovanni again the second day, doing the same thing. Giovanni had promised he'd take us out to lunch, though, to reward us for our work. He got up with the alarm at about 6.30, and I heard him go in and do the usual, make coffee. And um, at 7, I think I called out to him, what time is it? And he told me 7 o'clock. He and he called back and he said, but you know, I'm not feeling that good and I'm, I'm thinking maybe I won't go in and help Giovanni today. And I remember thinking, oh, it'll probably change his mind. But when I got up about 15 minutes later, he said, you know, I'm having a hard time breathing. And from the moment Dave told me, I'm not feeling good, I don't think I'll be going to Giovanni, to the time written on his death certificate was 40 minutes. He passed very quickly and without suffering and without pain or without fear. There was no fear in his voice. So his funeral was the next day and then it was after his funeral that, um, that I came, it was immediately after his funeral that I came home and I heard Dave say in my right ear, because he talks to me so clearly, right behind my right ear, he said, you have to let people know how happy I was. And so I wrote about Dave's last day and um, somehow um, got it to people that loved him as much as I did. As you can imagine, shock and disbelief were the initial reactions as news of Dave's passing quickly spread through Captiva and beyond. But along with the despair came the sharing of warm memories about this larger-than-life individual. Members of the Duncan family of Indiana, which held annual reunions at the resort since the 1970s, held a special remembrance ceremony for Dave at their annual gathering. One of the things we all remember and love and wish we had a recording of is sitting out here or walking around and hear Dave Jensen's laugh out across, echo across the parking lot. One of the friendliest people that you would ever meet in your life, um, well, yeah, even on days I think when he really wasn't working here, you know, he might come in, be raking out or whatever, and you could just hear him laughing all over the whole grounds. I mean, and that was just, that was just like heaven. <laughs> just a, a wonderful person. In May of 2021, the Captiva Island Historical Society invited island residents, visitors, business colleagues, and Twin Palm employees and customers to share their memories of Dave. 
that laugh of his was just like a lion's roar. And I can't tell you how many times in 27 years I sat out here on this boat getting prepared to go to work and I'd hear that laugh from the office. And uh, it, was just a, it was just a treat. Jeez, if anybody knew Dave, I don't think he had a mean bone in his body. I don't think anybody could ever say one bad thing about Dave Jensen. He, he is the, he's the biggest, best human being that, you know, ever walked the earth. Dave Jensen was such a pure soul and heart that every time you saw him, he had a smile on his face. And one of the best things about being over at the cottage across from the office was every morning when you'd wake up and Dave was working, you could hear his laughter resonating through the parking lot. And it was always put a smile on your face before you ever got out of your cottage. Dave Jensen had one of the biggest hearts I've ever seen for a person. I mean, he, he cared. A lot of times he knew I was down and out. Um, financially, he'd like, take me to lunch and throw me a couple of bucks and totally surprised me. But uh, Dave just really cared about people in life and uh, he was awesome. Dave Jensen to me was the kind of friend that you can only hope to have in life. He was there as a supporter in a million different ways, always encouraging our crazy ideas, participating in them, and I still feel his spirit today, and I feel it through the Jensen family. They all have that wonderful spirit of Dave's. Anytime you were talking to Dave, you were the most important person to him. Um, and he would give you all the time you needed, right up until, you know, till, uh, um, you know, Dave became a member of our board. It was the same way. If you went into that office to talk to Dave, he, he had time. For Dave was the same Dave every time you met him. He, there was no phoniness about him, and, uh, and he was just uh, one of God's wonderful creatures on this earth. It shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone that Dave's life would be celebrated on Captiva with music, dancing, and laughter. And that's exactly what happened in May of 2021 when friends and family members gathered at the Twin Palms Resort for a party in his name. But there was also a time for sharing memories. Dave was one of those people who just radiated wisdom. He radiated love. He radiated peace. He was just one of those who always made you smile, who just warmed your heart, and who just represented humanity. You know, it's not an accident that we have such incredible musicians here because Dave really um, kind of nurtured the songwriter community. And I'm really very grateful that you all are here tonight. Dave supported and lifted people up. I don't, I guess I don't have to tell you this. What I want to say is what a blessing it was that you were all such a part of his life that it led to this point that he was comfortable asking John and Jimmy, can I do this? Can I support, can I, can I go after my own dream now? And how fabulous was it that I was able to be part of Dave's life when he was confident enough that he can live his own dream yeah. the way that he supported all of ours for so long. Yeah. Amen. So, when, so when we think about Dave and we think about the happy-go-lucky fellow that he truly was, you know, think about how you made his life that much richer. Thank you so much. That's who I'd be If it were only me Here without your love Cause your love makes me complete That's who I'd be If I were on my own I never would have known How good this life can be That's who I'd be If I were on my own 
I never would have known how sweet this life could be. As far as a legacy goes, I would say the Jensens will be known for their generosity. Um, not generosity, uh, certainly in the things that are material, but the time they gave to the community and, and their laughter. <laughs> they'll, they'll always be known for that. You know, we want, we'd want people to feel, make them feel at home and uh, everything we did was for them, and it didn't, it didn't seem like work to us. And uh, the laughing, the laughing was the, you know, joke, probably from our dad telling jokes. We were just around that environment, and everybody, uh, we, we saw a little humor probably in everything. And, uh, and uh, you know, hopefully we, we created some great memories uh, that people can pass on. What they got when they came to Jensen's was coming home. They really felt like they were part of our family, which they were. And they'll always remember that and they'll carry that forever and so will we. And one of the big reasons they felt that way was our employees, they felt the same way about the resort as we did and the people, like the guests, the customers. We had so many guests come up and compliment how at home they felt because of everyone that was involved there. And a lot of people say, oh, the Jensen brothers, this and that, but we couldn't have been who we were if it wasn't for our employees doing what they had to do so we could be who we were. And uh, I feel blessed by attracting same like minded people and we had so much fun. It, it was a really a good life and uh, I hope they feel the same way. <laughs> Here we are
Vincent's Marina. I'm walking on Coquina over my good gal Tina. I lost her at Jensen's Marina. I lost her at Jensen's Marina. Thank you, everybody.